How many are believing God for power? Mighty, glorious power. Say amen. amen. The Bible says in, in, in Psalm 62, 11, it says this. God hath spoken once, twice have I heard it, that power belongs unto God. Power belongs to God. Well, yes, but all that power, we can have it for the asking. Because the Bible says all things are yours. Now, we know that power belongs to God, but how about us? What did he promise us? He said, you will receive power. Jesus said, all power is given unto me, yet he promised to give it to the church. But how? And what does it mean? What is that power we're talking about? Is it something we feel on our skin, like goosebumps? Is it, is it some high that makes us feel emotionally about to explode with joy? Well, what is it? It's way more than that. That power can affect every part of your life, spiritually, every part of your life, emotionally, every part of your life, physically, and every part of your life in every way you can look at it. The most important part is spiritually because it says that God will renew your strength. The strength of your spirit man. He'll renew your inner man, the Bible te uh, says to us. Now, when your spirit man is powerful, is full of power, everything else in your life will fall in place. Now, please understand something. Satan is waiting to trick you. He's waiting to trap you. He's waiting for you to fall so he can destroy you and bring shame to the Lord's name. His aim is to harm the kingdom of God. His aim is to harm the glory of God. God has a plan for your life, and the devil has a plan for your life. And it's up to you which plan you choose. Nobody serves God. None. You cannot serve nobody. Or you serve God or the devil. There's no in between. So if you're not serving God, the devil will take over your life. And you'll serve him without your permission. Because the devil doesn't ask permission. Remember that Jesus leads us, but Satan pushes us. Never forget what I just said. God leads and Satan pushes. There's no such thing as, as, as the devil giving you uh, uh, any, any, any freedom to choose whether you want to serve him or not. No, no, no. The devil is not a gentleman. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman. The Holy Spirit waits for you to ask. The devil doesn't wait for you to ask. So we must be protected by the Holy Spirit, but we cannot be protected unless we meet the conditions given to us in Scripture. When the enemy comes in like a flood, and he does, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard, and the word standard means he will cause him to flee. That's what one translation says. It says the enemy will flee. Well, he can't flee unless the Holy Ghost is there to cause him to flee. But the Holy Spirit cannot dwell in a vessel that is not obedient unto God, because the Holy Spirit has been poured upon us who obey, upon those who obey him, it says in the book of Acts. Now, prayer, prayer is a, is a, is a powerful key in the Christian life. But prayer is powerful in, in all religions because prayer brings spiritual power, whether God's power or the devil's. So you have to understand why Muslims pray five times a day. 
They pray five times a day because they have experienced power in that. Now, think what we would do, think what the world would be like if we prayed five times a day. If the body of Christ prayed five times a day, what this world would be like today. But we don't do it because, well, first of all, the flesh hates it. Your flesh does not want to pray. The, the flesh hates everything about it. Even though you may say in your heart, I'll do it, that flesh of yours will fight you. And often it wins. But you can break the will of the flesh. You, you, you can bring it under subjection. Now look, when I began as a Christian, I heard much about prayer and, and intercession and, and waiting upon the Lord, and we did it. Now today you hardly hear the, hear, hear, hear the subject. Nobody talks about it now. And so people are not praying because nobody is telling them to pray. But we have learned, we as Christians have learned that prayerlessness is destructive. It will destroy everything you have and destroy your future. So we have to pray. So God says, all power is mine, but that power is ours for the asking, the asking. We have to ask. So the poverty and prayerlessness of the average Christian finds its explanation in the words of James for verse 2. In James 4, 2, it says, you have not because you ask not. So, so the reason we're all powerless, the reason we're all empty is found in that simple statement in James 4, 2. You have not because you ask not. So the secret, the secret to power is found in Acts chapter 2. In, in Acts 2, 42, it says, and they continued steadfastly in prayer. That's the key. Steadfast. Not pray one day and not pray another day and pray one day and then not pray for a whole week. No, no, no. That's, 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 a, that's, a, that's a powerless life. There's no power in that. The secret to power is daily prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Daily contact with God is the key to power. You got to hear this. Daily contact. There's nothing more important in your life than daily contact with heaven. So there it is, Acts 2.42. They continued. They continued means they, they, they did not give up. They continued means they kept doing it. They continued steadfastly in prayer. And so Isaiah 40, verse 31, They that wait, wait means continual waiting, upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Well, you can't just wait one day. You wait continually. So, if you are too busy to pray, then you are too busy to have power. You can't have it then, can you? If you're too busy to pray, then you're too busy to have God's power. So, great activity, uh, no accomplishment, uh, much machinery and no results. People are working, but they're getting nothing for it. So there's a great deal of noise, a great deal of activity, but nobody's getting anything. Because without prayer, there's no power. You can scream and shout and work all you want, but the results are zero. Why? No power, no prayer means no power. And no power means all you do is wasted. Activity is not what God is asking for. He's asking for prayer. Now, the devil is not afraid of activity. Nor is he afraid of machinery. Nor is he afraid of noise. He's afraid of prayer. Because he knows the power that, that prayer unleashes on people's lives. Because prayer lifts you to a higher place. Prayer gives you what your spirit man longs for. Prayer gives you things that you cannot get on your own. Because you see, the, 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 the flesh has powerful desire and, and, and your, your desires in the flesh can destroy you. But when you pray, those, those desires of the flesh are weakened. They, they, they lose their bite. They lose their power. 
The power of God weakens the power of man, weakens the power of the flesh. So somebody's, uh, let's say, prayerless person watching TV and they see filth, they, they, they want to hook into it. They want to see it. They want to see more of it. Why? Because the flesh feeds on dirt. The flesh feeds on satanic dirt. The flesh feeds on what the world is giving you as a diet. But the minute you pray, you, you, and only then can you resist and say no. You, you begin to abhor the things of the flesh when you pray because the power of God gives you a whole different desire inside of you. You no longer desire the flesh or the or the things of the flesh, you're desiring the things of God that you did not desire a week ago. Because prayerless people are not desiring God or the things of God. But you pray, and within 48 hours, everything changes. Suddenly, you're desiring the things of God. 40, in fact, 24 hours at, in some cases, you will desire the things of God within hours, while only yesterday, you hated those things. Why? Because prayer changed your desires. Prayer changes your appetite. Prayer changes your hunger on the inside. What you hunger for changes with prayer. Because God begins to do it through you. Nobody wants to be righteous. Come on, the flesh, are you kidding? There's nothing in the flesh that wants to be righteous. The carnal mind is God's enemy. But yet, when you pray, everything in you longs for Jesus. Why? Because now there's power in, on the inside of you to long for Jesus. Prayerless people can't even, forgive me, prayerless people have no love for God. Because prayerlessness kills the love of God in you. Prayerless people don't love Jesus. They can say it till they're blue in the face. Because how can you love him and sin against him at the same time? So they say, I love him, but they go disobeying him. They go sinning again. They, they go hurting him and breaking his heart. On one hand, they say, I love Jesus. On the, on the other hand, everything they do shows they don't love him. Why? Because the flesh does not love the Lord. The, the, the flesh hates God. The flesh hates the things of God. The flesh hates the Bible. The flesh hates prayer. The flesh hates the Holy Spirit. The flesh hates the presence of the Holy Spirit. There's nothing that the flesh desires when it comes to God. But the minute you pray, everything in you loves Jesus. Everything in you loves the Holy Ghost. Everything in you loves the things of the Holy Spirit. Everything in you loves the presence of the Holy Spirit. Everything changes. Why? You say, well, well, I didn't do it. Of course you didn't do it. God is doing it in you. So prayer literally disrobes you of the flesh. And prayer puts new, new clothing on you. A brand new man comes on. That's how important prayer is. So, how does it begin? When, when you start praying, the first thing, if it's true prayer... The first thing that will happen to you is God will give you a revelation of yourself. It all begins with God pointing the, the, the flashlight on you. Suddenly, you're broken because that's what happened to Isaiah. The minute he sought God, he said, I'm undone. He began crying over his sin. Mother Bas Bas Basilea Schlink used to say, the minute you pray, God begins to break you by showing you what, how dirty you really are. So the first thing God will reveal is you, the real you. And when you see the real you, you will begin to hate your sin. When you see the real you, it will break you. When you see the real you, it will, it will crush you. And a broken heart, God will not despise. That's when repentance really happens. So God puts his light on you. So you start praying and the first thing God reveals is not himself. The first thing God reveals is you. The real you is revealed. Why? To break you. To show you how helpless you are without him. To show him how needy you are. 
And that's what happened in Isaiah 6, verse 5. Where, where, where Isaiah cried, cried out, Who is me? I'm undone. I'm, I'm, a, a, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a, a people of unclean lips. And, and, and like Peter, he, 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 you know, he said, Depart from me, I'm a sinner! Because he, he saw what his real self was all about. The minute you begin to pray, you, you, you see your real self, and only after you see your real self will you see what Jesus is really like. Because you'll, you'll see that he will accept that filthy person you are. Because you reject yourself when you're in prayer. I'll explain that. The minute you pray and God reveals the real Benny or the real Joanne or the real whoever. Or the real Jody or the real Laren. And suddenly you see the real dirt in your life. And everything in you cries out, what does God want with me? Because I don't want myself now. You, you begin to hate what you, what you discover about self. And then to your amazement, while you're rejecting the real you, God says, but I want this one. Well, how do you, why would you want me, Lord, when I don't want me? Because I'm Jesus and you're not. Now you see his love and... You see his mercy and you see his grace and every part of you breaks and starts to praise him. Because you realize suddenly how dirty you are and how holy he is. How undesirable you are and how, how much he desires you. How unlovable you are and yet how much he loves you. And then you can really sing you deserve the glory and the honor. So, Real doers in the church are true men and women of prayer. And like I said, the devil is not afraid of activity. He's only afraid of, of, of those that are on their knees. On yesterday's program, Pastor Benny Hinn began a message designed to give you the knowledge and motivation you need to activate the power of God through your prayer life. We as Christians have learned that prayerlessness is destructive. It will destroy everything you have and destroy your future so we have to pray so God says all power is mine but that power is ours for the asking the asking we have to ask so the poverty and prayerlessness of the average Christian finds its explanation in the words of James for verse 2 in James 4 2 it says you have not because you ask not. So, so the reason we're all powerless, the reason we're all empty is found in that simple statement in James 4.2. You have not because you ask not. So the secret, the secret to power is found in Acts chapter 2. In, in Acts 2, 42, it says, and they continued steadfastly in prayer. That's the key. Steadfast. Not pray one day and not pray another day and pray one day and then not pray for a whole week. No, no, no. That's, 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 a, that's, a, that's a powerless life. There, there's no power in that. The secret to power is daily prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Daily contact with God is the key to power. You got to hear this. Daily contact. There's nothing more important in your life than daily contact with heaven. Now, let's join Pastor Benny at his regular Monday night service in California as he continues his message on the power of prayer. Now, the Bible says to us very clearly that when we pray, it begins with a revelation of our our utter powerlessness, our utter worthlessness, we're, 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 we're filthy, we're unacceptable, we're, there's nothing in us we desire, and suddenly everything changes. We, 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 we see how filthy we are, and then we, we discover something about prayer, that prayer not only has power to, to, to reveal the real dirty person you are, but... But prayer 
has, has the power to cleanse all that dirt. Because as you continue to pray, then you can read Psalm 19, verse 12 and 13, that says, cleanse me from secret sin. It, because prayer has power to cleanse from all sin, especially that hidden sin in your life. Listen, listen. Everybody here has a thorn in your flesh. Everybody has a thorn. But the devil cannot touch it if you're praying. The enemy will not use it against you if you're praying. He, he, he can only turn that thorn into a weapon against you if you're prayerless. I hope you heard that one. Everybody in this studio, everybody watching me on TV, has a secret sin that only God knows about and you know about it. And that secret sin will destroy you unless you give it to God. Every preacher has a secret sin. Everybody, everybody has a secret sin. Because we are born with a sin, with a weakness that we will live with for the rest of our life. But it's, it's, it's controlled only by prayer. If, if you're not praying, it'll, it'll be out of control. That's why a lot of men cannot stop looking at women. Some men cannot stop sinning in their own hearts. Some men cannot stop looking at dirt on TV. Old women, same thing. There's always that, 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 that stronghold that wants to come out, that wants to, to get through, to come out of your being and system and, and connect to the devil's world. But prayer keeps it under control. In fact, keeps it almost non-existent. And you'll not be free from it till you see Jesus. Because when Paul said, deliver me from this thing, he said, my grace is sufficient. And God allows that thorn in the flesh to continue to keep you on your knees. God, in his wisdom, allows the devil to place that thorn in you. To keep you crying out for God. And the, and, and the power of prayer not, not only keeps this, this stronghold under submission and subjection, so much so it's actually non-existent. As long as you pray, you don't even have to fight it. But the power of prayer also gives you understanding when it comes to God's Word. It enables you to receive the Scriptures so you can feed the inner man. Now, prayer takes time. You, that's, that's something important. But prayer is a great time saver, too. Prayer takes a lot of time. But it's a great time saver. Because prayer is the most spiritual function in our life. It's the most powerful thing we do as Christians. It's more powerful than reading the Bible. It's more powerful and more important than praise. It's more important than anything you do as a Christian. Because if you don't pray, you can't worship. If you, can't, if, if you, if you don't pray, you, you can't praise. It's, it's, it's all a lie, and God knows it, and you know it. You're not praising if you're not praying because you're only singing, and God is, 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 is actually ignoring you. Because it's not coming from your heart. How can you praise God if you're not talking to Him? You know it's a lie. Come on. Try, try that with your wife. See if you ignore your wife for a week and one day you, you tell her, oh, you're beautiful. She says, you have be, you've not been talking to me for a whole week and now you tell me I'm beautiful? You're lying. You can't praise without prayer. Because communion keeps the relationship alive. And the people said, Amen. you got it. So, now here is a fact that I've experienced. Where there is much prayer, there will be much of the Holy Spirit. And, there, and where there is much of the Holy Spirit, there will be ever-increasing prayer. So prayer brings the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost brings increase to prayer. Here's, here's what I believe prayer is. Prayer is the, is the 
inbreathing of the Holy Spirit. Every time I pray, I take a breath. Every time I pray, I go, I, I'm breathing in the Holy Ghost with prayer. It's the, it's, it's the taking in of the Holy Spirit. So every time I say, Lord Jesus, I'm breathing in the person of the Holy Ghost. And the minute I start praying, the whole atmosphere in my being changes. Suddenly I'm into, I'm in a new realm. I start thinking differently. I start feeling differently. I start reading the Bible differently. I'm, I'm reading the Bible now with, with insight, with new eyes. I'm not reading the Bible and missing what it says to me. I'm reading it and it's capturing my soul. Because prayer reveals the word. Now, Jesus said something amazing. He said, if my word abides in you, you will pray. So it's a, you, you, you start with prayer. Now, Jean Guillaume, uh, uh, this great saint of God, uh, used to say that, that before she would ever pray, she would read the word till her heart broke. She would read the word until her heart became soft. Until she broke in the spirit, I mean. And then she would start praying after her heart had been touched through the scriptures. And now that's not always possible with us. So in my case, it, it actually happens both ways. I can, I, can, I can wait upon the Lord with beautiful worship music playing. And then at one point, I feel my heart begins to, to reach out. Because I have learned one thing about God. He, he will not listen to you till your heart is touched. Because it's not about seeking God, it's about being sought by Him first. It's, it's being touched by Him first. Because the psalmist in, in Psalm 80 said, quicken me and then I'll, I'll call upon your name. This is Psalm 80 verse 18. He, he said, quicken me and then I'll call on you. So you, you, you cannot call upon the Lord unless you're quickened first. Well, how do you get quickened? Well, some people are quickened. As they read the word, some people are quickened as they worship. Some people are quickened as they hear worship music. And here, it, here's what it says in Psalm 80, verse 18. So will, so will not we go back from the quicken us, and we will call upon thy name. Well, I cannot call upon God until God quickens me to, to call on him. And like Tozer used to say, you cannot call on God till he has called you. You cannot seek him till he has sought you. And that is true. But how does God seek us? God will seek us through His Word. And frankly, in, in most cases, you cannot really pray effectively unless the Bible has taken hold of you. And, and the Word gives you such life, and it, it gives birth to prayer, and it gives power. Anybody listening? It gives power to prayer, and suddenly it's like an explosion. And like I said, more prayer, more Holy Ghost, more Holy Ghost, more prayer. And then you come to that amazing truth in Mark eleven twenty four, where Jesus said that when you pray, whatever you desire, you'll receive it. Well, well, well that's not, that's not uh, uh, how shall I say, you know, I think the faith teaching misses one thing in this. Get this. The Holy Ghost moved and then God spoke. The Holy Ghost moved and then God spoke. God's voice cannot be heard without the wind of the Holy Ghost carrying it. Shall I say it again? Yeah. In Genesis 1, it's all there. It says the Spirit moved, and then God spoke. A lot of folks are speaking, and there's no Holy Ghost moving. That's the problem. So I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed. Well, the Holy Ghost isn't there, is he? So all your healed, healed, healed is nothing. It's all word, it's all, it's all brain, it's all... It's all dead. The Holy Spirit has to move first before you can say anything. And that's the truth of God's Word. That's what we mean by the rhema word, the life-giving word. You can't take the Bible and say, well, it says, so I'm going to claim it. Well, that's foolishness. It says it, but is God saying it to you? And God says it to you by His Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who will take that word and make it life to your being. And when the word becomes life and you then, then go out and say, God told me by 
his stripes I'm healed. My mother-in-law discovered, Pauline, Suzanne's mom, discovered a tumor in her, in her body. She was in prayer. And this is the key, prayer. She was in prayer. And while praying, God said, you're healed. And gave her a scripture that she claimed in the Holy Ghost. Say in the Holy Ghost. That's the key right there. She said, Roy, I'm healed. She, and Roy said, well, is it still there? She said, yes, but I'm healed. He said, well, how? She said, listen, I'm healed. Roy said, well, is the tumor still there? She said, yes, but I'm healed. And then he said, how do you know? She, he, he, she said, the Lord just spoke to me. The Lord spoke to me while I was on my knees in prayer. And she began crying when God spoke to her specifically and said, you're healed. She, they went to the doctor the next day. All the way to the doctor, Roy, my father-in-law, was saying to Pauline, please don't embarrass me. Don't tell the doctor you're healed. She said, Roy, I'm healed. Well, how can you be healed if they She said, listen, I don't care about the tumor. She said, God's word has become more real to me than the tumor. That's the reality of faith. She said, she, she said, this is not in my mind. This is something I know in my heart. And that's the difference. Faith is in the heart. They go to the doctor. They are sitting still waiting. Roy is begging her not to tell the doctor she's healed. But she is adamant that she's healed. As she's undressing to put some robe on, it disappeared. The tumor disappeared as she is getting ready. She walks into the doctor's office with no tumor. Roy freaks out. She's, of course, very calm because she knew it anyways. And her husband is, is, is praising God and blessing the Lord. And Pauline is just like, you know, I'm fine. I told you already, so why are you freaking out on me? <laughs> and Roy is all blessing God. And, and, and Pauline says, listen, I'm, I told you. And God spoke to her two days before that. She's, and she, she believed it and did it. And it was there. The Holy Spirit. God moved. God, the Holy Ghost, it says, and the Spirit of God moved, and then God spoke. Well, prayer brings that. And that's what Jesus was talk talking about when he said in, in, in Mark eleven twenty four. Therefore, I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, and he meant when you pray in the Spirit, believe that you've received them and you'll have them. But it's, it's all about connecting with God. Anybody still listening here? Okay, they that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. There's strength in the Holy Ghost now because you've been waiting upon the Lord. Now, there's five elements here that we are, we, are, we are looking at in this verse. That's very important, I want to say. When true prayer is there, when the Holy Spirit is moving upon the hearts of men in prayer, the heart's desire is real. It's not mental. The Bible tells us very clearly in 2 Chronicles 15, 15, it says, Judah sought him with all their desire. When, when, when the Holy Spirit is on you in prayer, your desire is, Whoa! everything in you desires it. It's not mental. It's not a wish. It's a desire coming out of your being. You understand that? That's like 2 Chronicles 15, 15. Judah sought him with their whole desire. Well, that's only possible by the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus said, whatever you desire in prayer, he meant Holy Ghost desire. And the Bible tells me in, in, in Psalm 145, verse 19, he will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. The desire of them who fear the Lord is the real desire. It's not about wishing and hoping. It's the real deal done in your soul. So desire is the soul of prayer. Say that. Yeah, and that's what Jesus meant. Whatever you, you desire in prayer, it's the soul, it's the heart, it's the real cry that, that's coming from the Holy Spirit in you, crying out for that desire to be met. It's the, it's the, it's the, it's the, and, and the second element of that is the desire has to be expressed audibly, audibly. When, when, when Jesus said to the blind man, what do you want? He said, I want my sight. I want to meet, I want to see. It was audibly expressed. It was a desire so deep. He spoke it out. And, and, and then the scripture says it must become 
the, the prayer of your lips, it's got to take hold of you. That's the, the, the third element in this amazing verse. Whatever you desire when you pray. So you make your desire a prayer. So number one, it's got to become the, the, the heart of your prayer, the, the soul of prayer. The second thing, you, 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 it, it's, it must be expressed audibly like the blind man saying, Lord, I want to see. But thirdly, this is important. That it's, it's, it's got to become a prayer. Desire must turn into prayer before it's answered. And then Jesus said the fourth element is accepted as done. Accepted as, as heard and done. This is the confidence we have in him is what John wrote. If we ask anything according to his will, he'll do it. So you have to accept it. But that's all by the Holy Spirit. And that's what Romans 11 talks about when it calls it substance. Anybody still listening, right? You're in prayer, and suddenly your desire becomes substance. And when it becomes substance, you say, I got it. That's what it means to have substance. It means you know that 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 you know you got it. That's what Jesus meant. Accept it as done. And the next thing he said, the, the fifth element, accept it by faith. Because you can't see it. So five elements to this amazing verse. Desire must become audible. That's two. It must become a prayer, number three. It must be accepted as done, number four. And received by faith, number five. Now, but all this is the work of the Holy Spirit. This week, Pastor Benny Hinn has been sharing a message designed to give you the knowledge and motivation you need to activate the power of God through your prayer life, positioning yourself to receive everything you ask for. Now, let's join Pastor Benny as he examines our Lord's words in Mark eleven twenty four. Therefore, I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, and he meant when you pray in the Spirit, believe that you've received them and you'll have them. But it's, it's all about connecting with God. Anybody still listening here? Yes. Okay, they that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. There's strength in the Holy Ghost now because you've been waiting upon the Lord. Now, there's five elements here that we are, we are, we are looking at in this verse. That's very important, I want to say. When true prayer is there, when the Holy Spirit is moving upon the hearts of men in prayer, the heart's desire is real. It's not mental. The Bible tells us very clearly in 2 Chronicles 15, 15, it says, Judah sought him with all their desire. When, when, when the Holy Spirit is on you in prayer, your desire is, Whoa! everything in you desires it. It's not mental. It's not a wish. It's a desire coming out of your being. You understand that? That's like 2 Chronicles 15, 15. Judah sought him with their whole desire. Well, that's only possible by the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus said, whatever you desire in prayer, he meant Holy Ghost desire. And the Bible tells me in, in, in Psalm 145, verse 19, he will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. The desire of them who fear the Lord is the real desire. It's not about wishing and hoping. It's the real deal done in your soul. So desire is the soul of prayer. Say that. Yeah, and that's what Jesus meant. Whatever you, you desire in prayer, it's the soul, it's the heart, it's the real cry that, that's coming from the Holy Spirit in you, crying out for that desire to be met. It's the, it's the, it's the, it's the, and, and the second element of that is the desire has to be expressed audibly, audibly. Where, when, when Jesus said to the blind man, what do you want? He said, I want my sight. I want to meet, I want to see. It was audibly expressed. It was a desire so deep. He spoke it out. And, and, and then the scripture says, it must become the, the prayer of your lips, it's got to take hold of you. That's the, the, the third element in this amazing verse. Whatever you desire when you pray. So you make your desire a prayer. So number one, it's got to become the, the, the heart of your prayer, the, the soul of prayer. The second thing, you, 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 it, it's, it must be expressed audibly like the blind man saying, Lord, I want to see. But thirdly, this is important, 
that it's, it's, it's got to become a prayer. Desire must turn into prayer before it's answered. And then Jesus said the fourth element is accepted as done. Accepted as, as heard and done. This is the confidence we have in him is what John wrote. If we ask anything according to his will, he'll do it. So you have to accept it. But that's all by the Holy Spirit. And that's what Romans 11 talks about when it calls it substance. Anybody still listening, right? You're in prayer and suddenly your desire becomes substance. And when it becomes substance, you say, I got it. That's what it means to have substance. It means you know that 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 you know you got it. And the next thing he said, the, the fifth element, accepted by faith, because you can't see it. So five elements to this amazing verse. Desire must become audible. That's two. It must become a prayer, number three. It must be accepted as done, number four. And received by faith, number five. Now, but all this is the work of the Holy Spirit. So, like I said, breathing is the, or prayer is the breathing of the Holy Ghost on our lives. Now, when you pray and the Holy Ghost is in that prayer, there's three things that are alive in you. Three things are alive. Faith is alive. Perseverance is alive. And the name of Jesus is alive. When you pray in the Spirit, when the Holy Ghost is, a, is, is in charge of what you're doing, and it all begins with, wait upon the Lord, let Him quicken your heart. When He quickens your heart, He'll pull you in. Remember that? Are you all there? You remember all that I said? Right, huh? You wait upon the Lord, and He quickens you. Psalm 8, 18, He'll quicken you, then you move in. When you are drawn in, now everything is controlled by the Holy Ghost, and the flesh begins to lose its hold, begins to lose its bite, begins to lose its power, and the power of God begins to fill your inner man where you become rawr, strong in the spirit, and suddenly as you become strong in the spirit, the flesh loses all its, 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 its power and effectiveness. Now, everything in you hates the world and hates the flesh and hates the devil's world and hates the sin and hates this and you love God with all your heart and Jesus makes you cry and you say his name and want to praise him and, and just you, you, you can't stop singing. You walk around in the, in the shower singing songs and when people <laughs> snap at you, you bless them. Uh, everything's fine. They curse you, you bless them. They hate you, you love them. Any, anybody on the stands, put your hand. Why? You're in the spirit. Haven't you heard the story of Maggie Hartner? Maggie Hartner used to work with Miss Kuhlman, and she had an enemy. She, she didn't like that woman. There was a woman that she just didn't like at all. One Sunday, Easter Sunday morning, they're having communion at the Stamba Auditorium, having marvelous time. Maggie's crying, worshiping Jesus. All is well and hunky-dory and lovely. She walks out of the, of the church, and she sees her enemy. She says, good morning. What a beautiful dress you have on today. You look so lovely this morning. Have a wonderful Easter. Catherine walks by. She says, what, what, what happened to you? She says, that lady, you, you don't like her. How come you're so sweet to her? Oh, Miss Schoolman, it's amazing how you can love your enemies in the presence of the Lord. Because <laughs> when Jesus is there, you love them all, right? It's all about Jesus. But that happens when you pray. And if you don't pray, there's no Jesus nowhere. And you know what I'm talking about. So, when you are praying, the Holy Spirit takes over. And when the Holy Ghost takes over, faith comes alive. When the Holy Ghost takes over, perseverance takes over. When the Holy Ghost takes over, the name of Jesus is all you have. And you say every prayer in Jesus' name. You know, I, I, can, I can tell my spiritual temperature in prayer, when I pray and I say, oh, Heavenly Father, do it for Jesus' sake. Man, when I say for Jesus' sake and everything in me is crying out for Jesus' sake, I know God heard it. It's like I know that I know that I know I touched his heart. But I can, I can be prayerless and cry, oh, God, help me in Jesus' name. Not, nothing happens because in Jesus' name has no power now because it's coming out of a heart empty. But when you say in Jesus' name with your heart full, it registers with God. And so, Genesis 32, 24 through 28 talks about Jacob wrestling with God. 
Through the ages, God's children have understood that some, sometimes God will hold himself back. God literally almost tries to get away from us until what is flesh is overcome, until what is sloth is overcome. So we prevail with God only as he pulls away from us. God sometimes has to pull away to see what's inside of us. That's what God did with Hezekiah. It says God pulled away from him to see what's really in him and to show him what's really in him. And sometimes God has to pull away for us to fight him back, to wrestle him back in place. Wrestling with God overcomes the flesh. Luke 11, verse 8, Jesus said, I say unto you, Though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, and God looks at you as a friend, yet because of his importunity, because of his perseverance, because the man just doesn't know how to give up, he will not give up. That's why he will rise and give him as many as he needs. In other words, if you just know how to fight, God will be smiling at you. The kingdom of God is taken by force. The violent are the only people who, who know how to take, take hold of God's promises. You've got to fight for it. Nothing in the kingdom comes easy. It's a fight. Every day you fight for it. So, God will not bless you till you fight with him because fighting and wrestling with him, and I say fighting, but I mean wrestling, wrestling with him overcomes the flesh. So, the strongest in God's kingdom are the best knockers. That's what Jesus meant by knock, 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 knock. He was saying, wrestle, 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 wrestle. Keep pounding that door till he opens. And that's what James 5 talks about. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man. James 5, 16. The effectual fervent. Fervent means knock, knock, knock. I'm not giving up. That's what it means. Avails much. So, all failure, all spiritual emotional and financial and financial failures is rooted in one thing called prayerlessness and prayerlessness is a sin not a weakness because in first samuel 12:23 samuel said i'll not sin against god by not praying for you so prayerlessness is a sin that was born in the garden when Adam sinned against God, he hid from God. Remember, there's hiding from God or hiding in God. Hiding in God is prayer. Hiding from God is prayerlessness. Am I saying too fast? Too much too fast? Well, I say it again. Hide in God, not from God. Adam hid from God, meaning he was not praying. Hide in God means you're seeking him. So he was hiding from God. Hiding from God is a sin. That's how it all began, because sin caused them to hide from God. And, and that's what Isaiah talked about in Isaiah 64, 7. He says, there's none that calls upon thy name, and watch this, that stirs himself to take hold of you. So you got to stir yourself up. You have to get yourself out of that place of, of misery and bondage. You get, you get yourself out of that place and... and, and Oh, dear God, I've got I've, I've to say this. In Jeremiah 3.22 says, Return you backsliding children. Uh, because that's what happens in prayerlessness. People start sliding back in sin. And God says, return, return. And then Jeremiah 8.22 says, If we don't return, we, we'll even get sick physically. Because it says, is there no bomb in Gilead? Now, I'm going to close with this. I'm reading Isaiah a few days ago. And man, everything in me was shaking. I preached this message at Christ for the Nations. I'm preaching this and, and dear Mrs. Lindsay back then who was alive, God bless her, she's in heaven now. She said, nobody can have this word except God had given it to him. Listen to this. I'm just going to read this and just hit the high points. Isaiah 52, awake, awake, put on your strength, O Zion, put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem. For henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake yourself from the dust, arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. 
Loose yourself from the bands of your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus says the Lord, you've sold yourselves for naught, and you'll be redeemed without money. For thus says the Lord God, my people went down a fourth time to Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. Now therefore, what have I, what have I here, says God, that my people is taken away for naught, and they that rule over them make, make them to howl. Therefore my name is blasphemed every day. And my people shall know my name. Therefore they shall know in that day that I speak. Awake, awake means pray, pray. And when you pray, you can put on strength. Because without it, there's no strength. And when you pray, you put on beautiful garments. Because with, without prayer, there's dirty garments. Sin mean It means sin. And then it says, when you pray, there shall no more, no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. The second you pray, God will clean you even from dirty friends. When you pray, you can shake yourself from the dust. Because people are in the dust. Shake yourself from the dust. Arise and sit down. Well, only how? Only if you're awake. Now, here's something God showed me years ago. He had said to Peter, uh, Simon! Simon said, yes, Lord. He said, your name is no longer Simon now, it's Peter. And that was his new name. The only time God called him Simon again is when he was sleeping in the garden. The only time God called him Simon again is when he was sleeping. Therefore, when we are prayerless, he calls us by our old name. And only when we pray, he calls us by our new name. Simon means reed. Peter means rock. When you pray, you're a rock. And when you're not praying, you're a reed. So you choose which one do you want to be, a reed or a rock. So Jesus says, Peter, 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 rock, rock, rock. But when he's sleeping in Gethsemane, he says, hey, Simon, Simon. Wow. I don't want God to call me a reed. When God changes my name, I want him, him to, to, to keep my name changed. Therefore, if you're prayerless, God looks at you as a sinner, not as a new man. How many of you don't want God to call you a reed? You want to be a rock, right? Yeah. So when you awake, when you awake, you'll put on your, your strength. When you awake, you'll put on new garments. When you awake, no unclean person will come near you. When you awake, you'll be able to shake yourself from the dust. means the destruction. When you awake, you can arise and then sit down. And sit down means you'll have authority. Watch now what it says. Loose yourself from the bands of thy neck. In other words, prayerless people are bound like dogs by the devil. He's got a thing around your neck because you're not praying. But when you pray, you release your neck from his hand. Somebody say, hallelujah. You release yourself from the bands around your throat when you pray. And for thus saith the Lord, you have sold yourselves for nothing. Which means prayerless people have sold themselves. And prayerful people will redeem themselves without money. For thus says the Lord, my people went down aforetime into Egypt to sojourn there. And they're here and oppressed them. So with, without prayer we're oppressed by the, by the devil. Now therefore, what have I here that my people is taken away for naught? It says, they that rule over them, make them to howl. It means prayerless people are so tormented, they're howling like demons. But when we pray, and, and by the way, he, he, he also says, that my name is blasphemed continually. In other words, prayerless people are bringing shame to God's name and causing the unbelievers to blaspheme his name. But when we pray, my people shall know my name. They shall know in, in that day. Which day? The day they awake. They shall know in that day that I am he that speaks. Behold, it is I. And as a result of prayer, we read that amazing verse, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of them who brings good news. Therefore, only prayerful people can preach the gospel. Prayer is so important. It is the most spiritual thing you and I can do as Christians. In God's Word, we read in Jeremiah 33, verse 3, where God says, Call unto me, and I will 
answer thee. What an amazing promise to us as his people. You as my partner, you as my friend, I want God to bless your life, meet all your needs. But God cannot bless our lives or meet our needs unless we pray, unless we call on him. And that's why I've brought you these messages on prayer, because I really want the Holy Spirit to, to birth divine hunger in not just your heart, but my heart, every heart so that we can call on him because they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. You know, we can be strong one week and very weak another time. Why? Because as long as we pray, we are strong. We're on the mountaintop. But if we don't, our energy level goes down and that's when the enemy can attack us. So that's why it says watch. Watch and pray, meaning watch your level of strength. Where are you in the spirit? If you notice that things are going wrong, get back to prayer because only prayer will keep you on the mountaintop. I pray these teachings will be a blessing to you. And please send your prayer requests to our ministry. We have a prayer center now here in California, 24 hours a day. People come and pray. And they're praying over your needs, over your requests. The prayer room upstairs that we have in this very studio the anointing is so strong you can feel it as you walk by that room because people go in there and pray all the time for your needs. You see all these needs? Every one of them has come down from the prayer room and goes back to the prayer room where people come and pray. So send your prayer requests. God wants to answer your prayer. And dear Jesus, we come now in faith and high expectation that you'll meet all our needs. Precious Jesus, you said, call on to me and I will answer thee. You said, I shall never leave thee nor forsake thee. You said, come on to me all you who labor and I'll give you rest. And so today we come because there is no other place to go to except to you. Where shall we go to? You have the words of life, Peter said to you. And we say the same today, touch every heart, every life, Bring healing, bring peace and faith to every heart and life. In Jesus' name.